You know, it is often said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, which was a saying popularized by Charles Caleb Colton in Volume 1 of Lakin in 1820, or many things in few words addressed to those who think. I want you all to keep that phrase in your mind for a moment while we discuss the opening for this subject. For the people of the Inner Sphere, the clan invasion was an awakening experience of existential dread and threat from the outside. These alien battle mechs would dramatically overmatch their own, but none of these monsters were so feared as the famed Mad Cat or Timberwolf, an advanced clan design which resembled the traditional designs of the Marauder and the Catapult. This nightmare tech would be the last thing countless brave defenders of the Federated Commonwealth, Rasselhog, or the Draconis Combine would see before their defeat or death in the opening stages of the clan invasion. In the quiet of the aftermath of the Battle of Tukian, those within the military-industrial complex of the Inner Sphere would take up an initiative to create a new generation of battle mechs using the most advanced technologies they had to hand. Notably, there would be many within the borders of the Federated Commonwealth who would seek to recreate the most terrifying battle mech they had faced while battling these invaders from beyond known space in order to forge for themselves their own ultimate war machine. But there was something missing. And that sadly holds true for not just these scientists, but also for Charles Caleb Colton's words. Oscar Wilde, the famed poet and playwright of the 19th century, would have his own take on the saying mentioned at the start of all this, which perhaps shows more honesty and more perception to the nature of it. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery that mediocrity can pay to greatness. With those words in mind, let us explore General Motors' Rakshasa. A heavy mech weighing in at 75 tons. The Rakshasa is perhaps one of the most controversial designs of technical readout 3055 or even the later part of the clan invasion itself. When General Motors began conceptualizing this machine, it was with a very clear goal in mind, which was to replicate as much as was possible the clan Timberwolf battle mech. Not only had this mech earned an enormous, fearsome reputation in the Inner Sphere, which it had demonstrated time and time again on the battlefield, it would change the nature of warfare from its Inner Sphere counterparts. Designs would be changed radically to counter the Timberwolf, or mechs like it, with the Inner Sphere coming to invest more and more in relatively pure technologies like double heat sinks, Gauss rifles, and even the Inner Sphere's flawed XL engines. While others sought to deter this marvel of a battle mech, as mentioned prior, the engineers at General Motors and the New Avalon Institute for Science sought to be the Prometheus of the Inner Sphere, and wished to capture the fire of the gods for the Federated Commonwealth. The NAIS would spend over five years researching captured examples of the Mad Cat in order to achieve this, quote, breakthrough, unquote, having started in 3049. In 3054, the results would be displayed by the Institute, and a new design would be prepared for production in 3055. This battle mech would be titled the Rakshaza, named for the mythical creature that mimicked its adversary's appearance and skills. The Rakshaza's development time, taking as long as it did, showed that the engineers and scientists behind its future implementation didn't wish to simply rush a product to the military and instead wanted to try to genuinely match the Mad Cat as closely as possible. To do this, while looking at the Prime variant, they would first peer towards the resources that they had available. Because the truth was, their breakthrough had nothing to do with cracking the code of any major clan technologies to hand. 
In other words, this research did not result in the ability for the Federated Commonwealth to produce equivalents to clan technology. They did not possess their hyper-advanced endosteel, the clan's massively superior ferro fibers plating, their clan XL engines, their lighter weapons, or their higher damage outputs. Though Intersphere Omnitech was in the works as well, the Rakshasa would not benefit from it, as that technology would begin to premiere in new designs several years later, at the final stages of the clan invasion era. Instead, the designers learned from the captured Mad Cat, presumably how to route the systems into different locations, align them to target, and mobilize the 75-ton chassis. Much of those five years of development were frankly spent just trying to emulate the Mad Cat's profile, which led to them needing to marry this with Inner Sphere technologies. General Motors and the NAIS would take the bleeding edge of every single available technology to attempt to make this possible. While they did not possess clan endosteel or ferrofibrous plating of such quality, they did have the Lost Tech Star League equivalents. They did not have the clan's advanced XL engines, but they did once more possess Lost Tech XL engines of their own. Everything was done to emulate the Mad Cat but within the bounds of their own technological limitations. This was down to even the very chassis itself. Having noted the Mad Cat clearly took some influence from the Marauder in its design, and with GM being a major manufacturer of the Marauder itself, the decision was made that when making this model, they were going to build it on a heavily modified Marauder chassis, dubbed the Special MD variant of it. Visible changes are of course quite evident in its appearance with a wildly different cockpit, for instance, as well as major structural changes to the back end of the mech. But this was the easiest, quickest way to develop the war machine. Following a modified structure and myomers of a Marauder was much more efficient than reverse engineering the entire structure of the Mad Cat and taking it into production. This also meant that parts would be on hand for production and repair in much shorter order, giving a greater ability for the mech to be manufactured and maintained. The problem is, when all of these factors started to be combined, it ceased to truly be an equivalent of the Mad Cat. While it is the same weight, and the same speed, and even approximately closely armored, it does not have the same range, cooling, and it certainly does not have the same firepower, or the same stamina. Now this would be alright in many cases, and your sure mechs are never meant to be in direct competition with their clan counterparts until later eras. But there is something which weighs into this design that goes beyond simply not being as good as a Mad Cat. The question becomes, are the Mad Cat's fundamentals good without the addition of clan technologies? Especially when factoring in the material values and even game battle values. Yes, the Timberwolf Prime is a fantastic mech. It is fast, it hits hard, and it has weapons for every range bracket in spite of this. But that is only possible because of its technological level. There are a multitude of examples of weapons that were just too early, despite their core concepts being sound. Many of the wonder weapons of World War II would fall into this category, but we can look to examples before that as well. The first firearms were inferior to bows and arrows, and sometimes they would even explode in the hands of their operators. The same could be said for the first cannons. Full plate armor in the Bronze Age from the time of the Hittites was in a word, ridiculous, and despite offering protection, provided enormous drawbacks. In the case of all of these examples, they were refined with time, until they evolved into thoroughly proficient technologies in their respective eras. The full plate armor of knights was agile, and extremely protective in the final generations of this type of metallic armor. A modern rifle is as far beyond ancient firearms as a main battle tank is to a chariot as well. The Rakshasa is quick for its weight. It is also fairly well armored externally. These provide it with some value, but this all comes with a very high cost, which I'll be discussing as well. The problem is, as compared to many of its peers in the 3050s, its firepower is not only finite, 
but it's hard to call it impressive because nothing in it is truly powerful. Twin large lasers, twin medium lasers, a medium pulse laser, and twin LRM-10 sounds okay, but for a 75-ton battle mech of its type, it can leave something to be desired. It also isn't a particularly cool running mech, as its inner sphere ER large lasers generate an enormous amount of heat for not an enormous amount of damage. In universe, in the original printing of 3055, it is mostly given a glowing review in its capabilities page overview, with only one portion of the text providing any critique. The last paragraph is as follows. Field testing and simulations show that the Rakshasa's mission profile matches that of the Mad Cat. Its weapons ranges and firepower are clearly inferior to the clan design. Despite this shortcoming, the Rakshasa remains a formidable heavy mech, with superior accuracy, speed, and maneuverability. While true that the Rakshasa, for a 75-ton mech, is more armed than most Intersphere mechs of the same weight who move at the same speed, it becomes a question of if that is desirable in the first place. And even then, it pays a steep price for that. Because if you thought the Rakshasa was cheap, you were dramatically mistaken. For General Motors to manufacture one of these machines is a shocking 19 million C-bills. The Timberwolf, with all of its clan technologies, is 24 million C-bills by contrast. In other words, it is an extraordinarily expensive battle mech that is intended to fulfill the same mission as the Timberwolf, while not being anywhere near as advanced as the Timberwolf, and the results are, in my opinion, predictable. Worse still, despite using the Marauder chassis, a chassis not subject to weak head armor, the creators modified it and made it emulate the Mad Cat so much that the Rakshasa shares the Timberwolf's weakness of having weaker head armor. The New Avalon Institute for Science and General Motors appear to have an out-of-place sense of humor as a result. I am sure that every pilot who sat behind that cockpit after discovering that it can be shattered with ease wondered to themselves if that was an out-of-season April Fool's joke. Or just pure incompetence. But all the same, there are both good and poor performance records for the Rakshasa on its report card. The Kelhounds would utilize a pair of Rakshasas in 3055 during the campaign against the Red Corsair, a pirate queen seemingly fighting on behalf of the clans. They performed to expectations during the campaign. When put into an all-out battle by contrast, however, the Rakshasa does not deliver anything like the same endorsements due to some of the mech's limitations. An alpha strike from the machine can be catastrophic to the machine itself, as demonstrated by this performance in Operation Goraro in 3057. When cornered by the Capellan Confederation, several of the 8th Fedcom's regiment's Rakshasas when forced into an intense fight-or-flight situation, would be destroyed through several self-caused ammunition explosions from overheating the mechs, in order to gain their maximum damage output, when frankly two large lasers just weren't enough. In an effort to make a war machine that could be the Mad Cat itself, the Rakshasa ended up being a battle mech that is truthfully a disfigured reflection of the original. And while it may be controversial to say, its mission goals are not able to be accomplished meaningfully because of the technological limitations of the Inner Sphere when they assembled this malformed Marauder with missile launchers glued onto it. Actually, if it was just a Marauder with missiles glued onto it, it'd probably have better traits. It'd genuinely be better off. The Mad Cat derived inner sphere design that is the original MDG 1A spared no expense in the quest to emulate its clan predecessor. It takes every step possible to do this, from the basic components all the way through to its weapon systems, and of course, including its 75 ton body. A product of the clan invasion itself, this Marauder chassis is built to be a fast heavy with a similar punch to what one would expect from a clan mech of similar weight even if it can't quite achieve that. In fact, in this breakdown, I hope to give some insight into what works and what doesn't work for this controversial design. 
As a result of this, when it comes to its core components, the Rakshasa has a series of advanced technologies for its production date. Despite using the general body of a Marauder, though heavily modified, the Rakshasa uses advanced endo steel in order to reduce its chassis weight from 7.5 tons to 4 tons. Though this comes at the expense of cost, and a number of critical spaces on board. For its time, it has a standard gyro and cockpit, if only because there were no viable alternatives to them. For its onboard electronics, it uses the reliable downband Micronics communication system. And for its targeting and tracking, its core system is the Sync Tracker Model 3942071, along with an advanced Artemis IV fire control system for its missile launchers. The latter of these is considered to be a major boon for the model, where the manufacturer consistently would promise accuracy as a part of the platform. This is largely, likely, connected to the fact that GM, due to technological restraints, could not arm the Rakshasa with LRM-20 launchers, like the original Timberwolf, and instead would have to promise something else in its stead. Accuracy was chosen to be this, however, at the cost of safety. For quirks, the Rakshasa has two, one of which is fortunate and another which is, well, sad. For the good quirk, it has the easy to repair quirk. This is likely due to it sharing so many components with the Marauder more than anything else, meaning replacement parts would be widely available. And it's also it's probable that technicians would be more likely to develop an understanding of it if they already knew the far more ubiquitous Marauder and how it operated. The other is the unfortunate one. While the Marauder has the narrow slash low profile quirk, one of the best in the game, the Rakshasa is unfortunately burdened with the weak head armor quirk, inheriting this trait from the Mad Cat. This variant of the quirk means that the Rakshasa has 8 points of head armor instead of 9, meaning that its total head life pool, including internal structure, is 11. It's not the end of the world, but with head armor, no one realistically ever wants to leave anything to chance. The largest single tonnage investment made by General Motors in the Rakshasa is its 19.5 ton GM 375XL fusion engine. This enormous power plant gives the Rakshasa a maximum speed of 86 km per hour, or 8 movement points in the tabletop game. This engine is meant to mirror the Clan Timberwolves, which is the same engine rating, but by contrast uses Clan XL technologies. I feel it's important to go over the difference here. Now with what an XL engine is. An XL engine halves the weight of a traditional engine, but at the expense of putting additional engine criticals into the side torsos. This means with a standard engine, if a side torso is lost, the mech can persist, often being given the title of being a zombie, especially if they have weapons in the center torso and head. An inner sphere -sure XL engine takes up so many criticals in the side torsos, however, that if a torso is lost, the battle mech will immediately suffer an engine destruction result, knocking it out of the fight. This also means that the engine is vulnerable to taking critical hits through the side torsos as well, either from floating through armor criticals or from traditional critical hits after armor has been peeled off. A Clan XL engine, however, only takes up two critical slots rather than the Inner Spheres three, meaning that if a Clan mech loses a side torso, it will be very damaged. It might even be crippled but it can continue fighting or it can limp away for repairs. The Rakshasa, in other words, mimics the Timberwolf imperfectly here, as while it moves the same speed and its engine is the same weight, the durability problem is vastly more pronounced in the MDG-1A and all other Rakshasa derivatives. But with such a huge cost to put into the engine, what is the reason for it? Well, it's simple. A 75 ton battle mech moving at such speeds is extremely impressive, especially when unassisted by a mask or supercharger. This is done to allow it to change positions, press attacks, or fight at the same rate as a clan mech in this weight category. It gives the Rakshasa options, and while one may be critical of the manufacturer investing so much tonnage and cost into something that can be a liability to the survivability of the mech in intense fighting, it cannot be denied that the Rakshasa does receive the mobility its original mission goals would require it to. 
Speed is life in Battletech, in many instances. And the Rakshasa certainly has it, comparatively. Where did it all start going wrong, one may wonder. Truthfully, wonder no further. The Rakshasa uses double heatsink technology and invests five tons into its heat management system. This gives it a total of 15 heat sinks, which will cool the mech by 30 every single turn. This is a more than respectable total for most heavy mechs in this time, and even from the same weight total specifically. Its progenitor, the Marauder in its 5D variant, has the same total. The basic chassis of the Mad Cat does as well, though notably its Omnimech technology means that many variants, including the Prime, allocate tonnage for additional heat sinks. The problem for the Rakshasa is, it will overheat in most conditions if it fires its two main lasers, along with additional weaponry. And in intense battles, it's going to often be forced to do so. This means that the mech runs often hot in both ideal and less than ideal engagement ranges. What does it mean to be well armed? This is a question the MDG asks in its own way. The Rakshasa 1A comes armed with a pair of Exostar Extended Range Large Lasers, a pair of Federated LRM-10 racks with Artemis 4 fire control systems, a pair of Martel Medium Lasers, and one Martel Medium Pulse Laser. The LRM racks are found in the side torsos, the lasers are mostly found in the arms, barring the Martel Medium Pulse Laser, which is found in the torso. This is a total of 28 tons of weaponry and ammunition which is a little over one-third of the mech's overall weight. Unfortunately, none of this firepower really commits to being a system that can reliably breach armor or punch holes. This opinion may be controversial, but the Intersphere ER Large Laser is not only a poor performer on the battlefield in regards to its weight to damage ratio, but it's also the source of many of the problems on this mech as far as firepower are concerned. It spends 10 tons on these systems, which collectively do 16 damage of both hit, spread across two locations. Which is not particularly impressive, but in firing them, which are its main weapons effectively, it produces 24 points of heat in a single round. This means, if it runs, fires, and then fires its LRM launchers, its next main system, which is really meant to be used with these lasers, particularly at ranges past 9 hexes, I should add, it will immediately begin overheating, generating a total of 34 points of heat in one round of fire. What's worse, those LRM launchers, even with Artemis, aren't necessarily reliable damage dealers themselves, and can still underperform in terms of their ability to land meaningful damage turn on turn, if they hit. They also have one ton of ammunition each, meaning that they only have 12 turns of fire before they run dry in a campaign, without resupply. This might not even be enough for a single battle. For a mech with double heat sinks, and one which invests additional tonnage of note into them, this is a disaster. This isn't even the mech alpha striking. The numbers don't improve at close range either, which means the Rakshasa is forced to alternate fire, reducing its already dispersed damage in order to run cool in battle. While yes, it outguns several of its peers from this era. These peers often have the ability to hole punch single locations. The Marauder's firepower is reliable, for instance, and blows holes in enemy mechs. And there are a multitude of configurations for it over time as well. The Rakshas's large lasers simply don't perform well during the clan invasion era and beyond. Despite being Star League lost tech, the Intersphere ER Large Laser is a worse performer than its predecessor, which runs cooler. This in fact leads to a field downgrade variant of the Rakshasa that tries to squeeze more functionality out of the mech by downgrading the ER Large Lasers to normal large lasers. And this happens so frequently it became the official 1B variant, meaning that the manufacturer actually offers some tips and support as to how to field downgrade this kit. In short, the Rakshasa spends a lot of weight on its weapons package and cooling, yet runs hot under most conditions either fighting in close or fighting at longer ranges. And quite honestly, the weapons it has are mostly mediocre and don't concentrate enough damage to affect armor breakthroughs reliably. 
This is a big problem if the mech is supposed to mirror the Mad Cat's mission profile. Alpha Striking, for the Rakshasa, if you'd probably not guessed, is not only out of the question, but it's potentially crippling to the mech. With such an action, should it be foolishly attempted, driving the mech 14 points over its heat threshold. Two rounds of this can result in the actual destruction of the mech through a self-inflicted ammunition explosion. Truly, ammunition explosions are a part of the dream of success that every mech warrior yearns for. It's a shame they included so many heat sinks to slow down that risk at all. What if I told you, despite being well armored, there is a hidden weakness on the Rakshasa that makes it a potential death trap? Well, you'd probably not be surprised at this point, but it exists. To start with, the 1A was equipped with 11.5 tons of Starguard ferrofibrous plating, giving it 206 points of armor. This is in and of itself quite viable for a 75 ton heavy mech, and is really only outdone by mechs which are slower and meant for more line offensive fighting, like the Orion for instance. This protection, combined with its speed, allows the Rakshasa to be quite hard to knock out of a fight, provided it doesn't lose a side torso. Interestingly, the MDG-1 series does do one other thing. In order to make their missiles more accurate to make up for the fact that they are not as good as, say, a Clan LRM-20, the Artemis systems were installed at the expense of case systems. Now, to those who know, this ammunition being detonated, even with a case, would immediately knock out the mech in most instances due to its XL engine. But without a case, this ammunition will travel through to the center torso, and has a significant chance of killing the pilot, should their own reaction time, or their auto-eject, not save them from it. It will also totally annihilate the machine, making it irretrievable, which means its easy-to-maintain feature doesn't work so well once the mech has been turned into burnt-out slag while it explodes. The Rakshasa, despite this, is a mech when combining in all factors is largely well guarded for its tonnage bracket, but does it have the ability to persevere for its mediocre weapon systems to outsustain its enemies? That is a question I leave to you. I don't like the Rakshasa 1A. Many of you will be shocked by this given the nature of the video so far. I don't think it dedicates itself to an offensive idea that works, and that in order to be useful, it functionally must overheat, which will inevitably reduce its battlefield functionality by being forced to cycle repeatedly, thus making its meager firepower more meager, or it will reduce its functionality by suffering the terrible impacts of overheating. There is a reason why in 3055 upgrade they inserted a story of these overheating and exploding against the Capellan Confederation. Because if it gets stuck in a real fight, it's going to need to Alpha Strike to survive. And that might ironically be its doom. The Mad Cat works in terms of its mission goals because of its clan technologies. Remove the technology, and you have a machine that can't do the same job. The Rakshasa works best as a harasser mech, trying to stay at the higher medium range bracket for its missiles and lasers, and trying to avoid direct combat or confrontation. It can flank heavier formations as well, and try to crit seek with its missiles. The Timberwolf Prime, on the other hand, can do multiple jobs of any type, barring outright recon, and can hole punch the armor of heavier targets, fire enormous missile barrages, and if worst comes to worst, it can get stuck in and unload its deadly clan lasers into targets, beyond just its ER large lasers, which are much better than Inner Sphere ER large lasers, I should add. It can fight up close, it can fight at a distance, it can fight head on, it can flank, it's a fantastic all-rounder. It's one of the reasons it has such a terrifying reputation, beyond just being a fast-moving and repositioning long-range sniper and support mech. The Rakshasa doesn't have this reputation for a reason. Great mechs typically aren't controversial, let's put it that way. While there are other variants of the Rakshasa, most of them are side grades in some way. While the 1B gives it more heat to work with, and makes it overall more effective in my opinion, the weaponry it brings to the field still feels lackluster. 
But more is always better than less, I suppose. The One AR is another, replacing out its LRM10s for MML7s, and a pair of snub-nosed PPCs are put in place of its laser package. And while this is fine, I don't know if I'd call this overall sincerely better by a huge margin either. But there is one variant that makes a relatively large amount of progress as a battle mech. Namely because it opts to be its own concept. The 2A removes all of the original weapons on board, and instead installs a rotary AC-5 autocannon into the left arm, with an enormous 60 rounds of ammunition, giving it 10 turns of continuous fire at full operation, if this is possible. This gun, on its own, will typically outcompete the twin ER large lasers, for instance. Then, for close range fighting, it has a large pulse laser and four medium pulse lasers, to ward off incoming targets or hunt them down. This variant is an interesting one, but is it good? I'd personally argue it's significantly better than the original. It can fight in close, and is very accurate and hits hard when it does so. At long and medium ranges, its rotary autocannon is a very powerful weapon, even if it lacks hole punching ability. That's something the MDG-1 series lacked for the most part anyway. It can burn through its autocannon ammunition before it uses its speed to gain on its enemies and then it can ruthlessly fight them in close. Or it can charge in, firing its autocannon rounds before it just closes anyway, looking for the killing blow using its pulse lasers. The 2A is the machine it is, which is a respectable one, specifically because it's not attempting to be a Mad Cat Prime. Because the Mad Cat Prime is only able to fulfill its mission goal, again, because it has clan technology. Who would have thought? The MDG-2A is a far more reputable model, especially among the people who field it. For some, the Rakshasa is a mech they've never heard of, even if they played Battletech for some time. Technical Readout 3055 as well as many of the inner sphere designs within, is often forgotten about, both by the myriad number of companies which have worked on the product, including FASA itself, and by the wider Battletech fanbase. For others, those who know of it, its reputation is split between those who appreciate its speed and armor, and those who view its collection of weapons as being flawed, even for its time. But sadly, I suspect the Rakshasa is in many ways a reflection of the Inner Shear's problems during this era of Battletech, in terms of many of the mechs FASA designed for them, or how they were utilized in-universe, or even by the players. Instead of leaning into the strengths the Inner Sphere had, creating dedicated machines for various roles and using their lower production cost, and battle values, to win the day, the idea was seemingly to create machines that could fight the clans head-to-head, -head, trying to almost mirror them as if they were a Bizarro-styled replica. But the nature of clan technology, and frankly how overtuned it was upon its introduction, just meant that it was a near impossibility for this to take place. In TRO 3055, it was the mechs that consistently got away from this mindset amongst the inner sphere which are the greatest examples of how the Great Houses could defeat the clans. With such masterful examples as the Salamander, Hollander, Berserker, Gunslinger, Cerberus, Naginata, and others. These mechs leaned into very specific roles for the most part, and did their best to master them in order to be one part of an ensemble cast that would play a better song than their clan counterparts who were all solo artists. The Rakshasa is a pale copy of a truly great battle mech, and that alone will always sour some of its reputation. It's a timber wolf, but not, yet costs 75% of the same production cost for whoever buys it. To just not have a timber wolf. There is a reason why Mindu Waterley, the former Primus of Comstar, demanded such a thing be made. And there is a reason why presenter Marshall Focht informed her that it would be nearly impossible to recreate the Mad Cat using Inner Sphere technologies. Focht understood not only were the clans too advanced to be copied, but even if they were, at the technology level of even the Star League, 
these imitation mechs would be vastly overmatched by the originals. This is exactly what happened when it was tried, and it is exactly why the Rakshasa, for better or worse, is viewed through the lens of being a failure, a fraud, and an imposter. It is everything Oscar Wilde said of imitation. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery that mediocrity can pay to greatness, as was said at the beginning of the video. The real strength of the Inner Sphere was not in building vastly expensive, high-quality battle mechs that could fight the clans on their own terms. It was always going to be a wasted effort to try, at least until technology truly started to leap forward in the Blakest Era through to the Dark Age. Before that, the means of victory for the Inner Sphere can be better summed up by a quote often attributed, without much evidence, to one of the most notable dictators of the 20th century, but one of the victors in the most savage war to have ever been waged on planet Earth, at least so far. Quantity has a quality, all its own. An alliance is a delicate thing, but I think ours will live beyond us. The day will come when our people will view our two states as a single realm with a single desire for peace. Thank you for joining me, Big Red, here today. My voice is a bit off today, but I don't think it's impacted the video. I hope it wasn't a problem. As usual, if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. A huge thank you to everyone who supports this channel as well. And with that, my unpaid intern will catch you in the comments section below. My name is Tex, and this is my favorite shop on the Citadel.